Um, I'm going to talk, first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is. I've, I've been coming here, I think, I don't know how many ideas festivals there have been. I think I've missed two. Uh, and so I, uh, it's just a pleasure to come here, see friends like Linda and Stuart and Michael, and just to be part of this every year since I was a wee lad. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, restoring social trust. And I'm going to do it if you know the new David. He's woo-woo and mushy. Uh, and so I'm going to do it um, talking about really interpersonal trust, uh, human connection. And for those of you who know me, uh, you know I'm not the most naturally emotional person in the world. If anybody saw Fiddler on the Roof, uh, you know a kind of Jewish family where everybody's hugging each other and singing together and dancing together. I came from the other kind of Jewish family. <laughs> And so the phrase in our home was, think Yiddish, act British. Uh, and so no emotion, no expression. Um, and that was true of me. It's remained true. Uh, some of you know a bit about my life story. When I was seven, I read a book called Paddington the Bear and decided I want to become a writer at that moment and have written pretty much every day ever since then and really solved my, my values around that. Uh, I, I met a girl in high school named Bernice who I wanted to date and she didn't want to date me, she wanted to date some other guy. And I remember thinking, what is she thinking? I write way better than that guy. Uh, and so those are my values. Uh, and people who know me well know I, uh, at 18, the admissions officer at Columbia Wesleyan and Brown decided I should go to the University of Chicago. Uh, and so that too is not an emotional place. Uh, the, Kids wear these t-shirts, sure it works in practice, but does it work in theory? And so it's super intellectual. My favorite saying about Chicago, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, and so that was not emotional. And then I went into journalism, and you would think journalism was emotional, but if you've met a journalist, that you're devolved of that attitude. I tell journalism students, if you're at a football game and everybody's doing the wave, and, Sure, uh, and, but you're the kind of person who doesn't do the wave. Uh, you have the right kind of aloof personality type to become a journalist. <laughs> and so then I went to the New York Times as a conservative columnist there and people, I tell this joke often, with a, being a conservative columnist at the New York Times was like being the chief rabbi at Mecca. Uh, not a lot of company there. <laughs> and then I got a, jo a job on television for PBS uh, on the news hour. And that too is a kind of, for TV, pretty cerebral. And so uh, I worked for a guy named Jim Lehrer for many years and he actually formed me in very important ways. So Lehrer would, when I said something, first 10 years, when I said something he liked, his eyes would crinkle. And when I said something he didn't like, his mouth would turn down. And so for 10 years I chased the eye crinkle and tried to avoid the mouth down turn. And in that way he really shaped me. He never said anything, he just, I could see what he liked. Uh, and then, and so our show is, it's a wonderful show and the spirit of Lair lives on in the show. We do have a somewhat seasoned demographic. Uh, so if a 93 year old lady comes up to me in the airport, I know what she's gonna say. I don't watch your show, but my mother loves it. Uh, <laughs> and, but I've tried over the years to learn emotion. I wrote a book called The Social Animal about emotion. And my friends told me that me writing about emotion was like Gandhi writing about gluttony. Uh, it's just not the natural thing. But I'm gonna talk a little about that and a little about interpersonal relationships. Because in my view, to build trust, you have to do a couple things. One, you have to keep showing up for people. But secondly, you have to make them feel seen, heard, and understood. So I'm gonna start with three little stories. And they're, they're not bad, they're not unusual stories. One was told to me by a woman about six months ago she was 13, she had her first drink at a party, and she got so drunk, when they dropped her off at home, she was on the front porch and she couldn't move. And her dad, who was a big, strict disciplinarian, came out, saw her, and she thinks he's gonna be screaming at me the things I'm already thinking in my head, which is, I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm bad. Instead, he just scoops her up, puts her on the couch inside, and says, there will be no punishment here. The experience is enough. So that, that's the first story. The second story is about a friend of mine who had a daughter in second grade 
and the uh, little girl was struggling, and the teacher said to her in one day in class, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that little comment turned the girl's year around because this thing she thought was an awkwardness turned into a strength that she could think before she could speak. And the third story comes from a movie I hope you've all seen uh, called Good Will Hunting. And if you remember the movie, Matt Damon character is this math genius who is going through the movie slaying people with his mind. But he has to go to therapy with the Robin Williams character and he slashes Robin Williams with an insult. And Robin Williams has him come out to a pond the next day and gives him this little speech. You're a tough kid. I ask you about war. You'll probably throw Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watched him gasp his last breath, looking at you for help. I ask you about love. You probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never looked at a woman and been totally vulnerable, known someone who could level you with her eyes, feeling like God put an angel on earth just for you who could rescue you from the depths of hell. I look at you. I don't see an intelligent, confident man. I see a cocky, scared kid. You're a genius, Will. No one denies that. I don't give a shit about all that. Because you know what? There's not anything I can learn from you that I can't read in some book. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are, then I'm fascinated. But you don't want to do that sport. You're terrified of what you might say. So these are three little stories that are not too unusual. But they're about three skills that are critical to being a decent person and considering it to those around us. The first skill is to see with understanding. The dad with the drunk girl knew what was going on in her mind, and he knew he didn't have to say a thing. The second is to affirm with insight, is, and this is what teachers are great at, to see skills in a person that the person doesn't see themselves. And the third skill is to critique with care, is to show somebody the failure of their ways in a loving manner and offer them a way forward. And that little Robin Williams speech is an example of great listening. The Robin Williams character sees the exact thing the Matt Damon character is trying to hide, that he's scared. And he also shows him a way forward. He says there are two kinds of knowledge. There's the knowledge you can get from books, and then there's the only kind of knowledge that you get from being vulnerable to experience and open to experience. One is knowledge and one is wisdom. And so he's really telling the Robin Williams character, you're good at one kind of knowledge. I'm showing you another path. And what underscores all these thrills, skills, it's the ability to see others and be deeply seen. And I've come to believe if there's one skill at the center of every happy family, organization, nation, or society, it's the ability for the people in it to feel understood, felt, and appreciated. A fundamental human drive is the drive to be recognized. And a fundamental moral act is to possess the craft that makes people feel recognized and seen. Some people are just fantastic at this. I'm sure you've met people who they just, you are with them and you think, wow, that guy's a great listener. There was a novelist named Ian Forster, and his biographer wrote of him, to speak to him was to be seduced by an inverse charisma, a sense of being listened to with such intensity you had to be your best most honest and sharpest self. Who wouldn't want to be that guy? When Winston Churchill's mom was young, she was seated one night at dinner next to the 19th century British statesman, William Gladstone. And she left that dinner thinking William Gladstone was the cleverest person in England. Then a couple weeks later, she was seated next to Gladstone's great rival, Benjamin Disraeli. And when she left that dinner, she left thinking that she was the cleverest person in England. <laughs> So it's good to be Dis Gladstone, it's better to be Disraeli. And so how good are you at seeing others and making them feel that you understand them? Well, I know some people in this room, but I don't know a lot of you. Nonetheless, I can say with great confidence, you're not as good as you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> they research this, there's a guy at the University of Texas, he finds that strangers in the midst of a, their first conversation can accurately predict what the other person is thinking 20% of the time. When it comes to friends and family, people you really know, people generally get it right 35% of the time. And in many married couples, their accuracy goes down the longer they get married. <laughs> and that's because when they were first in love, 
they formed an image of the model of who this other person is. But over the years, the other person changed, and the model didn't keep up. I have a friend who says he was married to seven people, but they all had the same body. She just changed her shape. <laughs> the skill of reading people by telling their facial expressions only gets you so far. So this skill is doubly important in a diversifying society. It's easier to understand people who are kind of like you. It's much harder for people completely unlike you. And our social skills are now inadequate to the society. And so what I see in my career as a journalist is an epidemic of blindness. It's blacks feeling their daily experience is not understood by whites. It's rural people feeling the coastal elites don't see them. It's depressed young people not feeling seen by anybody. It's Republicans and Democrats looking at each other in blind incomprehension. It's husbands and wives in bad, bad marriages who feel that the person who should know them best has no clue. There was a study by McKinsey about four months ago. It was about the great resignation. Why are people leaving firms? They asked the employers, why are people leaving your firm? And the number one answer from the employers, the CEOs, was they're going to get more money elsewhere. They asked the people who, are, who left, the number one answer, my manager doesn't recognize me. So the bosses thought it was a material reason, but it was actually an interpersonal reason. And so this lack of ability to see each other shows up as a, as a social crisis, a crisis of connection. It's in the stats. 54% of Americans say that no one knows them well. The number of adults without a romantic partner is up by a third. There's been a 73% increase in depression among young adults since 2007. The percentage of students suffering from anxiety disorders doubled between 2008 and 2019. Teenage suicide is up by 59%. 27% of Americans are estranged from a member of their immediate family. If you ask high school students, are you persistently hopeless and despondent? 10 years ago, it was 28%. Pre-COVID, it was 36%. And now it's 45%. So these are just a breakdown, not in the politics of our society, it's a breakdown in the personal lives of people. And morality is the skill of repairing that. And this psychology of different, of just alienation, first it leads to anger. Sad people don't say sad for long, they get angry. Because not being recognized feels like injustice, which in fact it is. But it manifests as a crisis of distrust, and that's what we've been talking about a lot this week and what we at Weave talk about. It's a generation ago, if you ask people, do you trust your neighbors, 60% said yes. Now it's down to 30% and 19% of millennials. And so you distrust sows distrust. You get a society gets into a distrust doom loop. And in my view, this doom loop can only be solved by a reconnection at the interpersonal skill of recognizing each other. We can try to solve things at the top, and that's great. I spent a lot of my time at that. But if we can't make each other feel respected and honored, it's not going to work. And so when I look across society, I see these forces of humanization, drama, art, music, literature, conversation, and forces of dehumanization, politics, often technology. And it's like this great war. And so how will the forces of humanization win out? Well, let me tell you another story to get us to do a different level of cognition. It's a story that occurred on December 26, 2004, and it happened to a guy named Emmanuel Carrere. And Carrere and his girlfriend and their respective sons were on vacation in Sri Lanka. And Carrere had thought this woman, Helene, was gonna be the love of his life. But over the previous months, they had begun to drift apart. And on vacation, he realized they were gonna break up. And Carrere was feeling sorry for himself because he thought Helene was really a wonderful woman who was worthy of love. But Helene uh, Carrere realized he's just not capable of love. He went back and reviewed all the relationships in his life, and he realized he had never loved anybody. And so he thought, I'm probably going to die alone. I'm just a self-centered guy, incapable of love. And so their little family unit uh, was sour, and they, it was only the third day of their vacation, but they wanted to go home. But in the meantime, they decided to cancel a scuba diving lesson they were going to take. And that turned out to be a consequential decision because that was the day the tsunami hit. Do you remember the tsunami of 2004? A couple days before, they had met another French family, uh, husband and wife team, Jerome and Delphine, 
and their lovely four-year-old daughter, Juliet. When the tsunami hit, Juliet was playing in the waves. Her grandfather was out on the beach reading the paper, watching her, and her grandfather felt himself get swept up in a wall of black water. He had two thoughts. The first was, I'm gonna die. And the second was, Juliet already has. So he's swept inland, and then the water starts receding, and he thinks he's gonna be swept out to the ocean. He happens to get pushed into a palm tree, which he grabs onto, and then is pinioned by a piece of fence. He survives, comes down, um, uh, bloodied and battered, and realizes he has to go into town where Juliet's parents are, a town which is untouched by the wave, and tell them what has happened. So he goes into town, he sees them across the square, and realizes they're experiencing their last moment of pure happiness. He walks into town, he sees her, them, and he tells them. And as Carrere writes in his book, Delphine screamed, Jerome didn't. He took Delphine in his arms and hugged her as tightly as he could while she screamed and screamed. And from then on, he had only one objective. I could no longer do anything for my daughter, so I will save my wife. And so over the next few days and weeks, really about two weeks, Carrere is with Delphine and Jerome, having meals together, trying to find Juliet's body, trying to just survive the blow. And he's watching them as Delphine, the mom, is just slipping in and out of reality. She's, her mind has been hit by this such a blow. She's just, just barely hanging in there. She's sort of catatonic. And Carrere watches her try to eat with a fork, barely eating in her hand, shaking in the air. Uh, and so this goes on for day after day. They're watching each other. And Jerome is on a mission to save his wife, to keep her together. And so the meals, he tries to keep everybody sort of upbeat. And so he's telling stories, cracking jokes, playing music, pouring drinks, trying to keep his wife with them. And Carrere is watching Jerome do this, try to save his wife. And he writes, at the same time, out of the corner of his eyes, Jerome kept watch over Delphine. I remember thinking, there it is, real love. A man who truly loves his wife. There is nothing more beautiful. But Delphine remained silent, absent, and horribly calm. After a couple of weeks, they, they retrieve her body, they go home. And at the end of his stay in Sri Lanka, he f feels just this incredible love for Helene, who has been busy taking care of everybody else's problems. And he thinks, he, tells, I, he writes, I tell myself that this long life with her together must happen. If I need to succeed at one thing before I die, it's this. And so what Carrere remembers of that day is the opening of his heart. What Helene remembers from that day is the moment she fell in love with Carrere. And they go on to get married and have a daughter of their own. Now I tell you this story because first it, it just illuminates human solidarity, but second it illuminates the human consciousness. How an entire consciousness can shift, a way of seeing the world, a sense of who you are, what you love, and how you change. Usually our consciousness change, change gradually over time. But in Carrere's case, because of the shock, he was one sort of person before the tragedy, he was another sort of person after. And so we see this, the, a human consciousness in dramatically shifting forms. And we see also that the wave hit them all, but each person had their own experience of the wave. Delphine trying to just survive, Jerome trying to keep his wife steady, Helene leaking in, into action. And so this is important because the crucial area of this action, like any action, is not only the wave hitting, it's how each person experienced what they experienced. Aldous Huxley, the great writer, said, experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. And so when we see a person, what are we seeing? We're seeing a person who has taken the examples of their life and, and developed a perspective on the world, a way of seeing things, your cultural heritage the struggles of your pasts, the traumas you've experienced, your joys, your loves, they all shape your distinct and individual way of seeing the world. We don't see the world with our eyes, we see it with our whole life. And if you wanna to get to know a person, you gotta to get to know how they see the world. They get, you gotta to get to know how they see you. And I just wanna pause with a little science 
just to illustrate how radical this is, how creative we are in creating our perspective on the world. Because each of us is experiencing this moment slightly differently from the others. So we think, as you look out into the world, you open your eyes and data comes in your world, into your eyes and your brain processes it and you see chairs, people, whatever stage. That is not how vision works. If vision worked that way, then there would be way too much data for your brain to handle. So what happens is your mind sends out predictions of what it expects to see and then your eyes check to see if the corrections are right. And so scientists make fun of this by, sh by manipulating people to show how badly sometimes we predict reality. And so you may have gone online and see a video and it's a bunch of people passing around a, a basketball and they ask people to count the number of passes. And then after they've counted, they say seven passes and they said, well, did you see the gorilla? They said, what are you talking about? There was a gorilla in the video. Nobody saw the gorilla. They watched the video again and sure enough, there's a guy in a gorilla suit waving his arms. <laughs> and people don't see it because they didn't predict gorilla. <laughs> My favorite version of this is there's a student who's a part of the research team asking directions of a student on campus. And while the directions are being given, two workmen who are actually researchers walk between them carrying a door. And one of the workmen drops off and the original directions asker picks up the door and walks away. So when he resumes giving directions after the door is gone, he's talking to an entirely different human being. <laughs> and the vast majority of the time, they do not notice because we don't predict that. And so researchers like to make fun of the weakness of this method. I'm sort of impressed by how good it is. If you heard the individual words I'm speaking, you would only be able to understand about 50% of them. But because your mind is so good at predicting what I'm about to say, you're hopefully understanding most of my words. And so this is an act of construction. And we construct based on our predictions of our past. We predict based on our culture. So if we go outside, if it rained and the sun came out, we would look up and say, oh, a rainbow. And we would see a seven bands. Now there's no color to a rainbow, it's just a bunch of light waves. There are no bands to a rainbow, it's just a continuum spectrum of light. If we are Russian, they have two words for light blue and dark blue. So they see eight banded rainbows. And so it's a sign of how color is not something that's out there, it's in here. And we use it to construct the world. And this is powerfully influenced by culture in ways we're not even aware most of the time. Here's a passage from a fashion journal in 1918. The generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. The reason is that pink, being a more decided and stronger color, is suitable for a boy, while blue, which is more delicate and dainty, is prettier for a girl. <laughs> we just don't see that way anymore, most of us. And so it's a creative process you're creating there's a guy in UVA named Dennis Prophet who asked high school or college kids, UVA's got, UVA's got a very hilly campus, he said, estimate the grade of that hill. And it's, it was really a 5% grade, but people tend to overestimate and they would guess 20 on average. And then one day, the, they asked questions and the students got it exactly right, 5% grade. They wondered, what happened, why did these students, why were they so good? It turns out that day they had interviewed members of the women's soccer team. And so these were extremely fit D1 athletes. And to them, the hill didn't seem that steep because they could easily walk up it. And this has been replicated in a zillion different ways. Obese people see steeper hills than non-obese people. People with backpacks see steeper hills than people without backpacks. People who've heard sad music see steeper hills. <laughs> and so it's another sign of what I just said. Experience is not what happens out there. It's what you do with it in here. And this is a profound prophet's theory it's known as affordances. When I first heard about it, it seemed like a nice gimmicky theory. But the basic, the basic idea is the way you see a situation depends on what you can do in a situation. And if you're rich, you see a, the stores of Aspen differently than someone who's poor. And if you're privileged, you, and where I teach at Yale, you see a different campus than people who don't have access to Yale. And you would think about this shows up time and time again. And it shows how truly subjective it is. One last bit about subjectivity. There's another cre creative process going on inside you. And that's the little voice in your head. You've got this little voice talking to you. Now, some people have this voice 100% of the time. But the voice is always talking. I, I'm like 
a lot of guys, average 23% of the time, the voice is going on. And so my wife will ask you, what are you thinking? I'm like, nothing. It's just, <laughs> it's just a nothing box up there. There's nothing going on. The voice in here is very different than the voice comes out of our mouth. So the voice in here is about 100, outside, 150 words per minute. The voice inside can go up to 4,000 words a minute. Uh, half the people use their own name when talking to themselves. A lot of people address themselves in the third person. And sometimes it's not clear if you're having the voice or the voice is having you. And a lot of people have different characters going on in their head. There's a Polish researcher who said, some have the faithful friend, the, the voice in your head saying, you're, go ahead, you're going great. The ambivalent parent who offers caring criticism. The proud rival who badgers you to be more successful. The helpless child who has a lot of self-pity. And so these voices are all part of the process that we're all going through to construct our reality. So each person you see is a creative artist. Not creating with a landscape, but artists of the real. Creating a landscape of reality. And so each person should be seen as Van Gogh, as Mozart. The act of creative processes going on in each of our minds is simply astounding, but it's all unconscious. And if you really want to get to know somebody or yourself, which are all part of the same process, you've got to have some sense of how their unconscious is shaping their reality. So how do you get to do that? How do you get to know somebody so deep? And you, most of the, us are, you know, we're going to know our husbands or wives or kids really deeply. But most of us recognize each other. It's not going to be that. And so I'm going to walk us through just a couple stages. The first I call illuminationism. The quality of attention you bring to another person is the central moral act of your life. You can bring egotistical attention, which you're not thinking about them, you're thinking about themselves. Or you can bring detached scientific attention. But some people beam at you with sort of a caring respect. And when you meet them, they just make you feel warm. I'm going to name drop for a second, um, because it's what I do. Uh, so I've, I've been interviewed twice by Oprah. And I can tell you when Oprah looks at you, there's a reason she's Oprah. You feel like you're a flower who just wants to blossom in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a quality of attention she brings. And I, I think we all know somebody like that. And it's a quality of attention that whether you're religious or not, I think there are two religious concepts that help you beam that right quality of attention. And that the first concept is the concept of a soul that in each human being there's a piece of them that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but gives them infinite value and dignity. And if you treat the guy at the counter, the guy driving you around the golf course, the girl you're getting drunk with in a bar, as if they have an immeasurably important soul, you'll probably end up treating them well. The second concept is made in the image of God. God is a creator, and each of us are creators. And if you treat somebody as the image of God within them, you'll show them the level of respect and deference which each person deserves. And so first is the quality of attention. The second stage is the quality, I call it accompaniment, though that's not my term, that's Pope Francis loves this term. And this is the way you walk with somebody. When I was a kid, I really liked this um, naturalist named Lauren Isley. And he was out by the Platte River in Nebraska. If anybody knows anything about the Platte River, it's, they say it's a mile wide and an inch deep. Lauren Isley couldn't swim, but he thought, I'm going to float in the river. And he just lay back, started floating down the river. And he could feel like the cold parts from coming down from the north. He could feel where it was flowing into the Gulf of Mexico. He sort of felt the fish around him. He, he said, I wanted to feel what it was like to be a river. And he wasn't swimming the river. He wasn't forcing the river. He wasn't treading in the river. He wasn't resisting the river. He was just accompanying the river on its journey. And there are some people who accompany you on your journey. It's sort of an other-centered way of paying attention. I have a friend, maybe a long-time Aspen uh, Ideas Festival goers, I have a friend named David Bradley, who has a fra phrase called coming in under. And he's just, he's always like, how can I be of help? And in the normal course of daily events, we're not doing deep conversation. Just, you know, picking up the kids, doing the shopping, hanging out. And accompaniment is just an other-centered way of paying attention and traveling with a person. We think of accompaniment most in music. A pianist may accompany a singer, 
paying attention to the singer, seeing what he or she can do to make the singer more beautiful. And it's just an other-centered way of traveling. That gets to the third stage of the skill of getting to know one, which is conversation. If you think you can empathize your way into another mind, like say, oh, I'm gonna imagine how they feel at this moment, and I'm gonna walk a mile in their shoes. Well, they've researched this, that doesn't work. You have to ask them questions. So I have gathered from conversation experts some tips on how to be a better conversationalist. And I'll share a few of them. One is treat attention as an on-off switch and not a dimmer. If you're gonna pay attention to somebody, it's 100% or zero, it's not gonna be 60%. Second, be a loud listener. I have a friend named Andy, when you talk to him, he's like one of those uh, people in a charismatic church. He's like, yeah, yeah, amen, amen, preach, preach, go. <laughs> I just love talking to that guy. <laughs> he's a loud listener. Third, make them authors, not witnesses. When people tell you stories, they don't go into enough detail. And so if you ask for the details, where was your boss standing where he said that? Then you get the real rich granularity in the narrative and you understand them better, they explain themselves better. The next one is do the looping. When somebody says something you're unclear about, try to paraphrase it back to them. You'll be amazed how, long, how often you are wrong. We tend to listen poorly and so you gotta paraphrase and clarify. Keep the gem statement at the center. Whenever you disagree with somebody, there's usually something deep down that you actually agree upon. If my brother and I are disagreeing about our health care for our dad, we both care about what's best for the dad. And if you keep the gem statement in the center, you can save a lot of relationships in the midst of conflict. Don't fear the pause. As I'm talking in a conversational gambit, say my, co my, my comment starts on my shoulder and ends at my fingertips. At what point have you stopped listening so you can start to think of what you're gonna say? Probably about here. And that's a problem because the part of your brain that thinks of what's gonna say is the same part of the brain that does listening. So let the person finish and then pause and show them you're listening and then respond. So don't fear the pause. The most important conversational skill is learning to ask good questions. In any conversation, the quality of the conversation is gonna be determined by the quality of the questions. And I, you know, I had dinner with a friend of mine who I only see like once every two years, um, but he happened to, we just had dinner in California, and he said, you know, I'm, he's like 75, he's like, what should I do with the remainder of my life? And we started talking about what we wanna do with the remainders of our lives. It was just a great conversation. And so kids are phenomenal at asking questions. So I have a friend named Naomi Wei, who uh, was teaching eighth grade boys how to do journalistic interviews. And she said, I'll sit at the front of the, the, ta the room, you ask me whatever question you want, I'll answer. So the first question was, are you married? No. Are you divorced? Yes. Do you still love him? <laughs> so the answer was yes. Um, so, what are bad questions? Bad questions are evaluative questions. Where'd you go to college? Where do you live? What do you do? That's like status ranking. Bad questions are closed questions. If I tell you about my mom, we say, well, were you guys close? That limits my description of my relationship with my mom to close or not close. That limits the answers we're gonna have. Good questions are open questions. Tell me about a time. And so there was a research, a, a, a genius lady who does focus groups was hired by grocery stores to uh, under, so they helped them understand why some people go to the grocery store really late at night. And she could have said, well, why do you go to the grocery store late at night to this focus group? Instead, she said, tell me about a time you went to, the last time you went to the grocery store late. And there was a lady in the focus group who hadn't spoken at all, and she said, well, I was smoking some weed, and I needed a menage a trois with me, Ben and Jerry. Uh, <laughs> Um, and so some questions are um, introductory questions. I, I weave when we have events. Sometimes it's, um, tell me about how you got your name. People start talking about their families. Where, tell me about a time you feel the real, real sense of belonging. People love to do that. When you get to know someone, you 
uh, the questions I love most are higher vantage questions that lift people out of their daily grind experience and they see themselves from 30,000 feet. So these, these are things that are like, what crossroads are you at? Most of us are at a crossroad at one point in our life, but we don't think about it. Like, we've got to step back. What crossroads am I at? What problem did you used to have that you now have licked? What would you do if you weren't afraid? I had a guy who was being interviewed for a job at the end of the interview. He went to the interviewer and said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And the lady started crying because she wouldn't be doing HR at that company. Uh, and I asked my students at Yale, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And privately, about 5% of my students say, if I wasn't afraid, I'd leave Yale. It's not the right school for me. But I need the prestige. So other questions. If we met a year from now, what would we be celebrating? If the next five years is a chapter in your life, what's this chapter about? I always tell college students, don't think, what am I going to do with my life? That's too big a question. Just think, what am I going to do with the next five years? Divide your life into chapters. Peter Block, who's a great writer about community, has a bunch of questions that I admire. What is the no or refusal you keep postponing? What have you said yes to that you no longer really believe in? What forgiveness are you withholding? And so these are just great questions. And they are how you get to know uh, somebody. Uh, and to me, this is the essential moral act. And not only this, the essential moral act, but the essential patriotic act. And I will say that aside from the honor you do somebody by paying real attention to them, getting to know them, it can feel incredibly delicious. I go around asking people, tell me about the time you feel seen. And they remember these moments, often with teachers or mentors. They rem remember them as great moments in their lives. And it's also great to be the one doing the seeing. So this happened about two years ago now, I guess. I was at my home in DC, and I was reading some boring book on the table, uh, and our dining room table. And my wife walked in the front door, which you could see from our dining room table. Uh, and she just stood there in the door. And the door was open, and the afternoon sunlight was coming in behind her. And she, I didn't even think she noticed me. And we keep an orchid on the table by the door. And so she just stood there, just looking at the orchid, sort of contemplating whatever she was thinking about. And I looked up for my book, and I saw her in the do door with the window, light coming in from behind her. And I had this feeling, wow, I really know her. I really know her. And it was, if you'd asked me what I knew at that moment, it wasn't sort of the personality traits or it wasn't the biographical details that uh, I would tell it, describe, used to describe her to a friend or something. It was sort of the ebb and flow of her being, the motion, how she sees the world, how she constructs the world, sort of right, the flow of her occasional insecurities, her occasional fierceness, her joys, her, she is a, uh, transcended iridescent personality and so you just felt the glow and the only word I could use to describe what it felt like to see her I wasn't observing her I wasn't witnessing her the only word in the English language that I can think of to describe it was beholding I was beholding her and it was a fantastic moment and it, it just felt like real deep human connection and we're not going to have that with anybody our dearest and dearest but if you can go through life like Disraeli, seeing others, showing them the kind of respect, so they walk away from you in a casual conversation thinking, wow, that's good listening. Will we have a healthier society? So thank you very much. Well, I've left some moments over for questions so we can immediately get to the January 6th hearings. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think we have two mic runners. If any has a question on any aspect of humanity, psychology, love, or January 6th, I'm happy for any. And uh, the lights are bright, so I'm having some trouble seeing if there are any hands. I see one right here. Right here. Sir, there's one with a gentleman in the hat. Right here. Green shirt, gentleman in the hat. 
Um, I was wondering, I've just uh, recently read a book that talked about some of the same things uh, you're talking about, and uh, it spoke about the animal body and our body language when we're in communication. Have you done any research or looked into um, body language and how that affects uh, communication between people? There um, is a fair bit of research on that, and there are tons of books on how to read body language. And of course, to some degree, we, body language is useful. When you see somebody closed in on themselves, uh, you, you get a sense of their personality. Uh, the general finding from most of the research is we vastly overestimate of how much we know by reading body language. Uh, that people are very different and they express emotions in very different ways. And if I'm just trying to look at you, you would be surprised how much your sadness look, looks like your contented look, which looks like your anxious look. And so that's why I emphasize conversation. The number one skill that correlates with seeing others deeply is verbal intelligence. It's talking and listening. Now, having said that, in the course of researching this kind of subject, which hopefully will turn into a book someday, uh, I've interviewed psychologists, and one of the really groups of people I've really enjoyed interviewing is actors, because actors have to get into a role. And I've asked them, like, how do you do it? And one actor told me, I take the part of me that ha I have in common with that character, and then I just expand it. And one character said, I had a, a a guy, and he said to me he was a hands in the front pocket kind of guy. So he walked around like this, hands in the front pocket, and that meant when he was trying to be bold and assertive like this, he was gonna be fake. And that's how he was gonna portray that character. It was that little gesture of hands in the front pocket that was the key. There's a Guy de Maupassant short story, and there's one little line in this short story about a character who's just a minor character in the story, and the line is, he was the sort of man who liked to walk through the doorway first. And you get a sense of like an elbowing kind of competitive guy. And so I do think gestures tell us something, but it's, we have to be humble about how much. The final thing I'll say is that I've had the pleasure, I wrote a book called The Social Animal, interviewing a lot of neuroscientists about, I don't know, 12 years ago. And I've interviewed a bunch then. I've interviewed a lot of the same similar sorts of people now. And one of the things that has changed in the way they think and their emphasis the first is they spend a lot less time on brain regions, what's happening in what region. The brain is really a vast system. It's not just one region. The regions matter, but they're not as important as we thought. But the second big difference is they no longer separate the brain from the body. That there are hundreds of millions of neurons in your body. Uh, your brain, one of, there's a great neuroscientist named Lisa Feldman Barrett, who says the primary thing your brain is doing is not looking outward, it's looking inward to find out which part of your body needs energy. You've got a body budget. Well, who, where, does, where should I send energy? Where should I take away energy? And so down the vagus nerve, it's reading your guts, your intestines, your heart and lung. And this is a process called interoception. That's the scientific word. The, the real world is emotion. Your brain is reading your body. Your body is experiencing emotions, which are valuation systems that tell you what you want and your brain is then trying to name the emotion. And one of the great skill we can give ourselves and our students and our friends is emotional granularity. Some people have very bad, simple emotions. This is good, this is bad. Some people can finally distinguish between stress, anxiety, uh, uh, feelings of uh, ennui, like they have all the little anger emotions all at once. And a lot of these emotions, by the way, are culturally constructed. So again, it's humans creating something, not the reality out there. Smiling didn't exist until the Middle Ages. The Greeks did not have a concept of smiling the way we understand it. I used to think it was because they had bad teeth. But, uh, <laughs> but so anyway, this is to say that even we can't see outside the body, what's going on inside the body is just tremendously important for how we see the world. See a gentleman in another hat with an orange shirt. I'll go come over here next. Yeah, you mentioned in the beginning um, you called yourself like a, a mushy version of yourself, and I'm curious if you had any experiences or moments that made you realize this is what you wanted to devote your life to, and this is like were there experiences that really kind of created that transition for uh, your research and area of expertise? 
yeah, I did a pretty good job of trying to ruin my life. <laughs> uh, I wrote about this in a book called The Second Mountain. I, I was the sort of person who was ambitious. Uh, I like writing my, uh, jobs that are fulfilling can weirdly be the most addiction inducing. And so as I described in the book, I went through this period where my kids were going away to college, my marriage was falling apart, and I had moved into an apartment and the symbol for me of how screwed up my values were, I wasn't having anybody over. I saw, tried to solve an emotional crisis the way any average American male idiot would do it by working my way through it. And um, so if you, I wasn't having anybody over. I, I had workday friends who I could talk politics with, but I didn't have weekend friends, which are the real kind of friends. And so if you open the drawer in my kitchen, uh, there was no silverware because I was eating out every night. There was just post-it notes. And if you open the, where the plate should have been, there were envelopes. And that's an objective version of a life that's grown um, hollow. And so I went through a hard time realizing how my values were out of whack. And so you go through these moments of the valley. And there was a, a great theologian who says, um, Moments of suffering interrupt your, every, your average life and they remind you that you're not the person you thought you were. And this is Paul Tillich saying, um, they carve into what you thought was the floor of the basement of your soul and they carve through that floor and they reveal a cavity below and they carve through that floor and they reveal a cavity below. And so you, in moments of suffering, you tend to see deeper into yourself than you knew existed because the pain is there. <laughs> And the pain, at least in my case, manifested itself as a perpetual burning in the stomach. It really had physical qualities, this social pain. And so you become aware of things, and then you begin to listen to Sinead O'Connor songs. <laughs> a lot of, I, I used to sit at night with YouTube. If anybody see, saw the Les Mis movie version with Anne Hathaway, if you can remember the dream I dream, she, she's like miserable. I'm like, yeah, I'm right with you there, Anne. Um, and so you go through that, and then I had a lucky break, which was a couple of, in DC, I didn't know, invited me over for dinner, and I was saying yes to dinner invitations when they came those days. Um, and I walk into a house, and there's a bunch of kids there, teenagers. So I walk into the shake a kid's hand, he opens the door for me, and he says, we're not allowed to shake hands here. We just hug here. <laughs> and I was not the huggiest guy on the face of the earth. And um, so I hugged them. And it turns out the couple, Kathy and David, had a kid in the DC public school, so had a friend James, who, whose mom had some issues and there wasn't always food or a bed in the house. So they said, well, James can stay with us. And then James had a friend and that kid had a friend. So by the time I come over that Thursday night for dinner, uh, there are 40 kids around the table and about 15 mattresses in the basement. <laughs> and uh, they called their community A-OK, -okay, all our kids. And so I joined the community. And for the next several years, every Thursday night, I went to dinner. We took vacations together. We celebrated holidays together. And the kids would turn at you, and they demanded emotional openness. They wanted to get your love. And if you live in DC, the most emotionally avoidant city on the face of the earth, uh, you, 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 even you, you beam out love. And so they lifted me out of the valley. And we've, in many ways, grew out of this experience of being in a really strong, forged community that was uh, salvific. Uh, and I'll finish off the name dropping. I hope she doesn't mind I say this in public. Um, after my second interview with Oprah, which was in between my third with the Pope, um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, she said to me, and it was a proud moment for me, so she had interviewed me four years and then four years later, and she said, I've rarely seen somebody change so much. You were so blocked before. And she's Oprah. She's got to know. Like, who else is going to know? So I thought there was a hand somewhere in this quadrant. Yeah, right. So, uh, David, you referenced uh, January 6th. So <laughs> not to change the subject. But you recently wrote about the work of the committee. And I just wondered if your thoughts had evolved in wake of the recent hearings. Yeah, I wrote that we shouldn't be paying attention as much to last, but mostly to the next January 6th to, of 2025. 
or January 6, 2029. And I said, what we need a committee to look at um, what are the weaknesses in our system? How many Trump is, are, have run for local office? What power do they now hold? What can we do to prevent the next election from being stolen? Uh, and, you know, I think they've done a good job with the hearings, and obviously this week's hearings shocked and surpassed all expectations. So I guess I have revised. But really, when you write a column like that, I wasn't so much saying we shouldn't have these hearings, which I do think. It was a rhetorical device to say we really need to focus on the next January 6th. And so I, I do think that these hearings have certainly, and really this week, have revealed things that we did not know and have made, as my friend David French says, a criminal prosecution much more likely. Uh, for those who are um, against Donald Trump, and I can't imagine there are too many in the Aspen Institute, um, <laughs> um, I, my personal belief, just as a political prognosticator, is I wouldn't get your hopes up that this is going to matter a lot. Roe v. Wade, that may matter. But I, I think the public has um, already accounted for this. Uh, and, you know, I travel around the country, and it's always interesting what you never hear about. And when Russia impeachment was going on, I never heard about it. And Democratic candidates never ran on it because people were not interested. And January 6th is bigger than that, but I, you don't see gener Democratic candidates running on it because people are cared about inflation and crime and other things. So those, those core driving issues, I still think, just politically, which is not to say we shouldn't, for the sake of our country and the face of our integrity of our country, have full accounting for what happened. Over here, a man in the white. So you say we should think in five-year increments. Um, where do you see the country five years from now? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you first where I got that. I, when I was uh, about 10 years ago as a columnist, um, I had one of the best things I ever did. I asked, um, I said, readers over 70, send me a life report. Grade yourself on how you did in your personal life, in your professional life. And the average grade was A minus professional life, B minus personal life. And I asked, like, and, like, asked them to, like, how did you, what did you learn in the course of your life? And some of the truisms were, were obvious. Like, nobody of the 5,000 people who wrote in essays about themselves, only one regretted taking a risk. Uh, and so that's a truism, but it's a true truism. And but then I noticed the people, a lot of people, there was one guy who gave himself an F for life. He says, I was, a Don, I was an Eeyore. And the people who really had real regrets about how they led their lives, um, they, uh, they just lived every day, day by day. And so they never stood back to take a re personal retreat and say, what are we going to do in the next five years? And the people who took those personal retreats, they really were more intentional about their lives. Now as for the country, I, I'll, I can tell a terrible news story. The decline in social trust is really hard to turn around. And so we could be in a distrust doom loop. I ask historians, how, how do people get build trust in societies? They're like, oh, we don't know, never really seen it. Uh, so that's not good. <laughs> and that, that would be a descent into cruelty and bitterness. I can tell a good news story, though, and I think I'm more inclined to think that one. In early COVID, I stumbled across a book called The Politics of Disharmony by a great political scientist named Samuel Huntington. And he wrote this book in 1981. And he said, there's a weird thing, if you go back through American history, every 60 years or so, America goes through what he called a moral convulsion. And these are moments when people get disgusted with established power, when a young moral generation rises on the scene demanding change, outgroups demand to be included in in-groups, you get a new communications technology comes on the scene, and there's just a lot of anger and bitterness and division. And so this happened in the 1760s, or 1770s of the revolution, happened in the 1830s with Andrew Jackson's populist movement, it happened in the 1890s with the progressive era, and it happened in the 1960s. So writing in 1981, he said, I don't know if I believe in 60-year cycles, but if the pattern holds somewhere around 2020, we'll have another moral convulsion. Pretty good, pretty good call. <laughs> Uh, and so the good news about moral convulsions is you get through them. If you remember, for those of us who remember, I don't really remember what I was a kid for it, uh, the late 60s, 
assassinations. There were 4,000 bombings on American college campuses almost per year. Vietnam, recession, vast cultural changes, civil rights changes. It was a convulsion. But we came out of it because people are good at adapting to the challenges of the moment. You create a culture, it works for a little while, then the culture stops working and society falls into turmoil and you have to chop it up. And those moments when you chop up a culture are bloody and scary. But we come out of them. And so in 1968, it seemed like the world was coming apart. By 1974, well, in 65, if you look at the high school yearbooks, everybody has crew cuts, the guys. 68, half the kids have crew cuts, half have long hair. 75, they all have long hair. Sort of a new cultural scene, friendlier to feminism, better civil rights, uh, and all the violence of 68. By 74, it was like they were into crystals and Est and the Esalen Institute and all that stuff. Uh, and so it sort of calmed down. It's hard to stay this angry that long. And so I mostly put my money on our ability to adopt cultural change. And that's something we all do together. And I do believe we have had a 60-year period of extreme individualism. And we have all realized the failures of narcissism, of isolation and individualism, and we're all looking for some kind of community. We're having a big fight over what kind of community we want to have. And so I, I have basic faith in our ability to recover that. Maybe one more question. If we can come all the way down to the front. Thank you. Here, here's the mic. Condolences on Mark Shields' passing. Um, I may be doing a dozen things on a Friday night. I go out of my way to tune in. Tell us a little bit how it worked. Yeah. Um, it was wonderful. <clears throat> so Mark was what you saw. We have different opinions for many, where we worked together for 20 years. We never had anger on or off the set. And that's because Mark is so, uh, such a generous spirit. And he did it a long time. It was, he did it with me. It was Shields and Brooks. And then before that, it was Shields and Chico, if you remember. Before that, it was Shields and Gergen. And then before that, it was Shields and Coolidge. Uh, and then it was Shields and St. Thomas Aquinas. I mean, he did it a long time. He was older than me. But, you know, Mark, um, he's a Boston Irish. And I happened to be in Ireland when we learned of his passing. And I realized, wow, there's a lot of Ireland in Mark. Warmth, great personal warmth. Complete lack of pretension and always rooting for the underdog. Uh, and so, and he brought those values and off the air we didn't talk politics that much. We talked about sports, we talked about family, he would ask about my kids. Uh, and so he, he was just a generous, unpretentious man. I remember, you know, he's a significant Washington figure. And he came to one of my kids' bar mitzvahs and the way Jews do Kaddish after the service, you just stand around and nosh. He, and Mark, he was Catholic, he didn't believe in standing around, so he just sat on the floor in the middle. <laughs> and he had fun and people joined him on the floor. And so that's the unpretentious uh, guy. But you know, and it, it, it was obviously sad. But when you reflect upon that life, he begins his career in the 60s working for Democratic candidates, gets to work for great candidates, Robert F. Kennedy, got to work for Edmund Muskie, as he joked in 72, uh, he said, I was the guy who told Muskie to show a little emotion. Uh, if, you, if you remember, Muskie went out of the race after he appeared to be crying. Um, so then he gets to be a pundit and a columnist and a new TV show host through consequential eras, the Reagan era, the Clinton era, the Obama era. One of the highlights of me being with Mark is sitting in the 2004 Democratic Convention when Barack Obama walked on the stage. And we were blown away like everybody and Mark whispered, that guy's gonna be president. Uh, and then, so he has this long career. And his wife, Anne, is a, truly an amazing person. His kids are amazing. If we signed up for life at age one and said, you can have Mark Shields' life for the next 85 years, we would take that deal. <laughs> and so it, it's, it was just a pleasure to get to know him. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you so much.